I have been waiting for Planescape since I first got into D&D six years ago. First, Planescape Torment is the second best D&D computer game ever made. And I just love adventures and settings where anything could be around the next corner. Everything is possible. One way the developers describe the Planescape setting is behind the scenes of the D&D universe. So what do the angels and the demons do with their paid time off? So I couldn't have been more excited about this set of books, Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse, and many thanks to Wizards of the Coast for sending it my way. The set includes three books and a DM screen. The books, as per usual, are a setting book, a bestiary, and an adventure. In order to get these videos out to you as quickly as possible, I'm going to review each book separately, starting with the setting book, Sigil and the Outlands. So, dress in layers, make sure you have your portal keys handy, and don't get pruned, we are going to Planescape. Today's video is brought to you by Hitpoint Press. The Fable Maker's deck of many things features 46 stunning foil cards in full color and monochrome variants, illustrated by the Eisner Award-nominated artist Yoshi Yoshitani, as well as an Oracle guidebook with brand new effects for your 5e games. The full color cards can serve as a familiar deck of many things, while the monochrome underworld variants come with their own brand new effects based on the themes of the Oracle cards. Expand your journey with bundles including Don John D. 20 spinning pins, reading mats, and more. Pull your delight or your doom. Pledge today at thedeckofmanythings.com or by using the link in the info icon above or the doohickey down below to let them know we sent you. Back at Gen Con in August, we were invited to chat with Greg Tito, Jason Tondra, Mackenzie DeArmas, and Wesley Schneider, who worked on the Planescape project, as well as the upcoming official D&D Deck of Many Things set, which, by the way, looks really good. We're going to talk about that one here soon. Now, at that meeting, we were able to get an early look at the books and ask our questions, so I'll be sharing some of those insights here with you as we go through this. When Planescape was first introduced, the idea of a multiverse was relatively unknown to mainstream audiences. But now with Loki and Across the Spider-Verse and everything everywhere all at once, and the multiverse of madness and dozens of others, Wizards thought that the time was right to revisit the setting. This is the second three book box that they've done like this after Spelljammer, and that set got mixed reviews. One of the points that they emphasize to us at Gen Con is that they're incorporating that feedback into this new series, including the lengths of the various books. The Spelljammer books are trying to do so much with an incredibly low page count. The Astral Adventurer's Guide was only 64 pages long, and a third of that was just ship stat blocks and maps. Sigil and the Outlands here is roughly 50% longer, coming in at 96 pages, and it feels like they made better use of their space as well. It's divided into three sections, new player options, and the setting guides for Sigil and the Outlands. So let's hit each one. For player options, in a nutshell, you're getting two new backgrounds, seven new feats, two new spells, and three new magic items. The first background is the Gate Warden for someone who has been exposed to intense planar forces and experiences. And Planar Philosopher is for those deep thinkers who belong to one of the 12 factions presented later in the book, or one of your own creation. As for feats, they are tied to which plane you're most influenced by. The prerequisite feat for all of the other ones is Scion of the Outer Plains, which you get for free with the new backgrounds. Depending on which plane you're a Scion of, you get a free cantrip and resistance to a type of damage. You can see those options up there. It's, if it is a lawful plane, then you can take the Agent of Order, which lets you deal some extra force damage at range and possibly restrain foes. It also lets you increase one ability score by one, which almost all of these feats do, and I'll let you know the one that doesn't do it when we get to it. If you're from an evil plane, you get Baleful Scion, which is similar, but you can deal additional necrotic damage at range, which you can then transfer into hit points for yourself. If you're from a chaotic plane, you get Cohort of Chaos, if you like, which is pretty fun. You get a d4 rolling table of random effects to use anytime you roll a 1 or a 20. If that's used in my game, I am expanding that table to at least a d20, maybe a d100, because four options is definitely not enough. Scions of a good plane can take a Righteous Heritor, which lets you reduce damage suffered by your allies. If you're from the Outlands in particular, you can take Outlands Envoy, which gives you the Misty Step and Tongue spells. Finally, you get a more general feat, Planar Wanderer. You still get that Scion feat first, but then anyone can take this one. 
You get three benefits. After a long rest, you gain resistance to either acid, cold, or fire damage. You're able to open portals without a key, which can be pretty helpful. And you know the direction to the last planar portal that you use, and you can detect the location of nearby portals. That's the one that doesn't include the ability score increase. The new spells are Gate Seal, a fourth level abjuration spell that lets you lock down an area. Portals can't open there, and spells like Planar Shift and Gate Fail. Warp Sense is a second level divination spell that lets you detect portals within 30 feet of you and determine where the portal goes and what key you need to open it. Those spells can be used by sorcerers, wizards, and warlocks. And your three magic items. First, the Mimmer, a skull-shaped device that will be your tour guide through the plains. You can use it to also cast legend lore. The Portal Compass allows you or shows you the direction of the last portal that you used. And a sensory stone contains the essence of a single experience that lasts six seconds that can then be shared with others. And let's just say that you're going to learn a lot about your players based on the sensation that they decide to store in it. I am not a power gamer, so I can't speak to the relative strengths of these new options, but from a thematic and storytelling perspective, which is more of my speed, I am pretty happy with all this. Though again, I do think there was room for more spells and backgrounds at least. Moving on to Sigil, the crossroads of the multiverse, the city at the center of the Great Wheel, the City of Doors. It floats above an impossibly tall mountain called the Spire at the center of the Outlands. The only way into and out of the city are through one of the many portals around the city, all of which are controlled by the enigmatic and godlike figure known as the Lady of Pain. The sigil section of the book is roughly 45 pages long, and it covers life and sigil, including trade and services, and getting around the city and language, and information on the portals, and how magic works differently in the city, and the Lady of Pain herself, and the 12 factions of the city, the six wars that comprise the city, and running adventures in sigil. The portals are a lot of fun, actually. They are anchored by different objects, like gates and windows and doors and wells and wardrobes, even chimneys and reflecting pools. And they each require specific keys to activate, so you aren't likely to open one by accident, though it can happen. Portals can lead to other places in the city or into one of the other outer realms. For example, a portal might exist in a blazing hearth. If you have the appropriate key on you, namely some metal ore or a granite cube, you can activate the portal, hop through, and find yourself either in the smoldering corpse bar in the hive ward of Sigil or in the elemental plane of fire. As for the various factions, each one gets a column of text with their sigil, no pun intended, their headquarters location, their aligned plane, the types of people who join, their epithet, their leader, their attire, and their role in the city. For example, the Heralds of Dust, or the Dusters as they're called, think that everyone is already dead and that the multiverse is the afterlife. Think that lost fan theory that never went away. They see undeath as a step towards true death, which is the existence beyond the multiverse towards which they strive. The Dusters are led by a lich, naturally, named Skull, who founded the faction long, long ago. He aims to know everything and feel nothing. They are the Morticians and the Undertakers of Sigil, and there are 11 other factions as well. Each ward of the city gets four to six pages with random encounter tables, information about the factions that operate in, the, in that particular ward, including their headquarters if it's located there, and around eight to 12 other important locations. One major location in each ward gets a gorgeous full page art piece that includes an ungridded map. For example, this is the Civic Fest Hall in the Clerk's Ward, the headquarters of the Society of Sensation, another one of the factions that prizes, well, I think you can probably guess. You can rent out those sensory stones from earlier to experience sensations like a warm bite of a flaky pastry, the feeling of getting your ear to finally pop after taking a flight, or that mixture of satisfaction and shame that you feel when watching those close-up videos of people pulling out ingrown hairs. The bulk of the book really is this tour through the words of the city, and without going into spoilers, it is just as surprising and fun as you could hope. Every location has its bit of charm, and it takes good advantage of the cosmopolitan nature of the city. It is the crossroads of the multiverse after all. Your players are going to have a lot of fun there. Next, we move outside the city into the Outlands, which makes up about 36 pages of the book. The Outlands is a disc-shaped plane at the center of which you will find Sigil floating above that impossibly steep peak. 
Around the edge of the Outlands disc are a ring of 16 evenly spaced towns, which are each constructed around a portal to one of the outer planes. Each of these towns is dramatically influenced by whatever plane they border, and the bulk of the chapter is devoted to these 16 towns, which get two pages each of information, including important NPCs and locations, uh, including the gate itself, uh, regional effects, art, and a D4 rolling table with adventure hooks. I will very quickly roll through these 16 towns for you. Bordering the clockwork nirvana of Mechanus, you'll find the town of Automata, which contains the Concord Terminus, a resplendent train station for the Concordant Express, the modern operated interplanar train. The town of Bedlam is the home to the gate to the windswept depths of Pandemonium. It is the home of runaways and people who don't want to be found. There you'll find the gatekeeper Cirrus the Silent, the pandemonium-born, apparently mute cloud giant. Somewhat similar is Cursed, home of exiles, outcasts, and betrayers. There you'll find the gate to the Tartarian depths of Carceri, situated between Hades and the Abyss. A much better vacation destination is Ecstasy, keeper of the gate to the blessed fields of Elysium. Ecstasy is governed by beings known as the Light Caller and the Night Whisperer, two apparent mortals who have never been seen together. The town's cardinal rule is do no evil. You'll find Celestials and mortals living in harmony in Excelsior, the gate town at the foot of Mount Celestia. While the flightless residents are generally found on the surface, the Celestials are often found in the cloud-topped comforts of the Chandelier. When gate towns become too similar to the plane they border, they are absorbed and must be forged anew, which is what happened to Fennel, which contains the gate to the Beastlands. Now you'll find freshly grown vegetation and newly arriving beasts among the ruins of the old town. If you like ordered beauty, which I do, you may find solace in fortitude, neighboring the peaceable kingdoms of Arcadia, and home to lines of identical trees and homogeneous moral rectitude. The people are nice, but neurotic, as you might imagine. Glorium is your Valhalla-type town leading to the heroic domains of Isgard. You'll find snow-covered mountain peaks and blood-speckled shores that witness countless glorious battles. It's also home to a prophetic coven of hags. A less popular tourist trap is Hopeless, with its gate to the gray waste of Hades. The only way into Hopeless is through the Screaming Gate. The folks who live there are dreary and lifeless, rather like the denizens of Barovia. Speaking of places with very anti-tourism names, welcome to Plague Mort, border town to the infinite layers of the abyss. Plague Mort is home to Blightsteel Keep, from which the autocratic Arc Lector rules with an iron hoof. Under brimstone skies lies the accurately named town of Ribcage, where you'll find the gate to the Nine Hells of Bator. In order to make sure that the town doesn't become so evil that it's absorbed by the Nine Hells, its succubus duchess limits the number of devils who are allowed within the town limits. The permanent military encampment of Rigus holds the well-fortified gate to the infinite battlefield of Acheron. Rigus is ruled over by six crown generals, and the entire town obeys a very strict hierarchy of rank. If you're heading out on spring break, stop by the boisterous glade known as Sylvania, home to the Fae and the Gate to Arborea. You haven't lived until you've been to a rave with singing harpies and dancing elves and hobgoblins, all grabbing the occasional good berry off the vine. If thievery is more your bag, you might enjoy a weekend in Torch, a den of crooks nestled among three volcanic spires. There you'll find a gate to the bleak eternity of Gehenna, plane of suspicion and greed and birthplace to the Yugolas. If a shopping trip is more your speed, stop by the ethical trade hub of Tradegate, where you'll be able to hop over to the trade paradises of Batopia. The Everything Emporium very much lives up to its name. Finally, you'll find Zeos, which takes the general chaos of the Outlands and condenses it down to localized chaos as your gateway to the madness of Limbo. Most everything in Zeos is ever-changing, though a group of Modron have arrived to try to bring a little bit of order. There are a few other smaller areas of note in the Outlands, but I'm going to leave those for you to discover. And that's the book. Overall, I'm really pleased. It is a fantastic, diverse setting. There are a ton of amazing places to visit, strange people to meet, and unusual things to do. And what more could you ask for in a setting book? 
The length of the book feels sufficient. There's enough here to keep you entertained. If I'm being honest, it does feel a little stretched thin. Each of those 16 towns could have had a whole chapter in a larger book. So reducing them down to essentially a page and a half when you consider the art does make, does make them feel just a little bit shallow, requiring you, presumably as a DM, to embellish and fill in the details if you wanna have adventures there. The only other thing I want to bring up is not specific to this book, but is something that I'd love to see more of in all these setting books from all the games. Now, this book is absolutely filled up with so-called adventure hooks. Like I said, each of those Outlands towns gets four of them. So, for example, in Tradegate, one reads, During a demonstration for the characters, a gnome inventor's latest creation, an iron golem runs amok, wrecking havoc. In the party town of Sylvania, on the other hand, a vampire bachelorette invites the characters to a costume ball at the Yearning Timbers, hoping to enlist their help in choosing her next partner. And those are all fine, but let's be honest, they aren't adventure hooks. They're more like encounter hooks. I would love to see books like this give us a short chapter, like five or ten pages at least, giving us advice on crafting a full campaign or adventure in that setting. Give us a few story skeletons and decision trees using information from the setting book in the bestiary. Give us tips on making thematically appropriate adventures that take full advantage of the various genres you'll find in the book. A multiversal campaign or adventure implies that the genre of the story you might tell might change from week to week. One day your table is in a horror movie facing demons and hordes of monsters. The next week they're exploring a seemingly celestial utopia that may have sinister underpinnings. And the next week, they're in a jungle survival movie. And the week after that, they're infiltrating organized crime and torch. How, as a game master, do you manage those shifts in tone while telling one cohesive story? The Dungeon Master's Guide does give you some tips on adventure writing, but there's one book that I've come across in recent years that did it better than anything else, and that is the Galaxy Exploration Manual for Starfinder, which has a whole chapter on crafting sandbox-style sci-fi adventures. There's all sorts of advice and examples on crafting your setting and adding in secrets for the players to uncover, modifying existing material to suit your needs, all sorts of stuff. While lots of folks have a natural storytelling talent, I think the rest of us could use additional help in crafting truly captivating adventures that are more than just a series of events that happen to our characters. Anyway, Sigil and the Outlands is part of the three-book Planescape set, available now on D&D Beyond and available on October 17th at your local game stores, though apparently after December you won't be finding them as much in the mainstream bookstores, at least until something changes. But you can get the digital and physical bundle for about 80 bucks, the physical books themselves for between 60 and 85 bucks, and the digital D&D Beyond version alone for 43 bucks. The alternate cover versions, which you can see over here, are available exclusively at Game & Hobby stores. Let me know what you think about it in the comments section down below, and don't miss out on the Fable Makers Deck of Many Things Kickstarter from Hit Point Press to get yourself some absolutely gorgeous collections of really thematic cards at a fantastic price for your 5e games. And stay tuned for my review of the other two books and the DM screen coming up here really soon. Be sure you're subscribed to see all that. If you have any questions about the books, just let me know down below. I'll do my best to answer you. And you can also adopt yourself a cuddly kobold to accompany you on your journeys in game and real life over at HeroPlus.com. You can find me on social media at one of these sites over here. For now, though, stay safe, have fun, love each other, and I will see you next time at the Gallant Gong.